you'll notice we haven't got them up there yet, but the one time I make mention to them, Maddie, <laughs> that's okay. I, the, I put a title of every one of these chapters, and I don't often mention it, but I think it's important to mention uh, this one tonight, is the silence. The silence. When we look at chapter 6, we see chapter 6, God called through uh, the angels to come, and he was opening the seals, and it just seemed like one seal after another, seal 1, seal 2, seal 3, seal 4, uh, seal 5, seal 6. Now when we get to seal 7, there's a pause again. And I believe that pause, and you'll, you'll hear me mention this several times, that pause is because of the solemnness of the impact of this seventh seal being opened. Because with the impact of this seventh seal becomes seven trumpets. Each of the seven trumpets have an impact not only on this earth, but have an impact on mankind. And each of the seven trumpets have, have an escalating, expanding judgment to this earth, not just a particular nation, not just the bad guys, the earth and every living inhabitant of it. This is what I would describe as an ominous silence. If I remember the definition of ominous, it's, it's foreboding. Uh, I had to learn when I was in Germany, the word for foreboding is very similar to ours, but if you didn't say it, pronounce it just correctly, it meant forbidding. And we got told them, I said, well, in America, particularly down in Texas, we got the same thing because we're a different country in Texas than those people that live up in the north. <laughs> they're, uh, they're foreigners to us and vice versa on the way we speak at times. But it's, and I've even read where what I call the modern theologians, they've read and they said, well, you know, God could have done this, God could have done that, God could have put it all together. And yeah, God could have done a lot of things, but he chose not to. And he chose not to because he wanted us to see the seriousness, the progressiveness, and I said the, uh, the ever increasing impact of these judgments on a wicked world. We do have a wicked world. It doesn't get better with every generation. In fact, it's gotten worse for every generation. I was listening this past week to the news where I can't remember what school district it is to where the parents have been objecting when they have discovered that the school library and the education system at large has books to where they have been teaching their children pornography. And they, they, they have a right to object to that. And they had ladies, mamas, speaking from both sides of the, of the fence. And one lady, which they chose to put on television, and this is CBS, and she says, I disagree with all of these over here in the extreme right, she referred to us, because my child has the right to decide where he or she, I don't know, fits, and then she rattled off all of the letters, the L, B, G, T, Q, T, whatever, community. And I thought, God have mercy. If this mama feels like their son or their daughter can be a homosexual, can be a lesbian, can be a transvestite, can be whatever you know label you want to put on them, uh, they're back actually opening the door for that to happen. And they're ignoring, maybe she doesn't know, maybe she's, she's, uh, I, I, I always, my wife says, well, you always try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, I do, and I, I always have said that I look at the glass being half full as opposed to being half empty, and uh, I know that God has a plan for this earth, and I know that those that reject him, that reject him, and that's key, that decide that I do not believe in God, are the ones that are going to hell, and that, that's the choice they make when they do that, is they're going to hell. These circumstances that we're going to read now in these seven trumpets are going to slow down in terms of the way God gives them to us. 
Yes, God could have said the, the seventh the seventh seal is going to open and there's going to be seven trumpets, boom, 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 and, and this and this and this. Let's move on. He could have done that, but he chose to slow down and focus on this because he wants us to understand the severity of it. In verse 1, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I had somebody ask me once, said, well, Brother Smith, you're always saying that one day in heaven is like a thousand years on earth. What's a half an hour in heaven? Something to think about. Don't know if that's our half hour or if that's heaven's half hour. But why? I believe, again, it's because of the solemnness of what God is getting ready to do. He's unleashing his judgment on this world. Now, having said that, the pause, every pause that we have read about so far, and there'll be pauses that we're going to read about until we get to chapter 22, is because God is saying, okay, I'm giving you one more opportunity. One more opportunity, mankind, to turn to me. I've actually stood at the door talking to somebody that was saying, well, I don't believe God created all this. It just happened. I said, well... How do you explain yourself as being created? Just happened. I said, well, good luck with that. Because that's about what it boils down to is luck as to what's going to happen to you. But I said, God created everything that is created. This world is his world because he created this world for mankind. He created mankind. He created this body that I have, this body that you have. He created everything that we look out there as, as we may drive along and say, oh, what a pretty tree. He created that tree. Everything that grows, everything that is here that, that constitutes this earth, he created. He created these brains that gave us the capability to advance in technologically uh, circumstances that we have over generations and that he, he created heaven for those that trust in him. And let me, let me make this emphasis. He could have created robots out here. Is it robots or robots? I usually say the opposite. My wife corrects me when I get home, and she's not here. So anyway, it's robot, robot, whatever. He could have done that, but he did not. He gave us the freedom of choice. Right. That is one of the reasons why we see such a backlash against our government today in this circumstance that we're facing with this pandemic is that the people, they're, they're opening their eyes to the realization that we have allowed our government over time to take away our freedoms. I was looking back through my archives today and I ran across an article, I think it dates back to the 60s. There was a pediatric physician that wrote a paper and the, the paper basically dealt with the fact that if we're going to let these, if we're going to control, basically what he was wanting to do is control the growth in our country, then we've got to look over here to this thing they call the Bible, and we've got to change that. We've got to rewrite that. We've got to uh, take away this word, and we've got to put words that, uh, that have different meanings. We've got to cause doubt. We've got to cause confusion. We've got to do all of that to this Bible. Then it will take care of what we want to do here in order to control our population, which basically was in support of abortion. And that's happened. That's happened. You've got 200 English versions out there. You've got, I, I, I have 2,800 people on our Facebook page and and uh, every, every once in a while, I'll read a verse that one of them posted on there, and I said, that isn't the King James. And I go back and I look, and, and uh, it's one of these other versions. They're, what they're doing is they're picking a version that supports what they believe, what they want to share out there. God doesn't give us that option. He gave us his word, and he says, that's it. Amen. It's pure. It's preserved. It's for you. But he's not going to force us to believe it. That's our choice. 
We can choose to believe it or not believe it. But what he's revealing to us in the book of Revelation is that every choice this, this earth, the people on this earth make has a consequence. We're living in, in today's time that we're suffering from some of the consequences that resulted from our forefathers. One of is that we've got 200 versions of the Bible today. And, and I could go on, but I don't want to digress too much other than the fact that point out to you that a lot of what we're seeing today is, is revelation being revealed. Every time you turn on the television, uh, you're seeing revelation being revealed. Now look at verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. This, this is awesome. And when we stop and think about it, what God's going to do here. I want to jump ahead a little bit, and then I'll back up, because I'm afraid I won't get it in. I've commented back and forth that the, the description that we're seeing here is that of a potential nuclear explosion. The description that we, we read about in Sodom and Gomorrah has the description of a nuclear explosion. Now, the question is not whether there'll be nuclear explosions. The question is whether man's going to cause them or whether God's going to cause them. And it may be both, which is my, my interpretation. It'll be both. But in 1979, I was wrapping up my, uh, my bachelor's degree in Munich, Germany, in the University of Maryland. And I had, uh, uh, I can't remember what I was taking. I think it was a geology class that I thought would be easy. It wasn't easy, but it was interesting. And there was a uh, there was a professor that came in and, and gave a presentation on the destructive forces of the nuclear bomb. So what I'm going to what I'm going to share with you are the notes that I made about uh, from that uh, that lecture back in 1979, and they haven't changed except that our capability has probably multiplied hundreds of times. This was in 1979. If a nuclear bomb were to be exploded above Dallas. 7,000 feet above Dallas. That's a mile and a half high. It would kill every living thing in a 13 and a half mile radius on the ground. Every living thing. Every living thing. That's every man, every woman, every child, every dog, every cat, every cow, every, every grasshopper. It'd kill every living thing. The shock wave alone would be 560 miles per hour, and that equates to about a, a three quarters of a million other people killed outright as the shock waves go out. Outside the perimeter of 13 and a half miles, for about 15 more miles, the survivors would be inflicted with a minimum of a third degree burns over their entire body. This will be caused from a sea of fire that will give off approximately 1700 degree heat. This is in 1979. Beyond this area, which will include square miles equal to the size of New York State, not the city, but New York State, there will be more burns and maiming from projected missiles, both man and from both man and uh, man himself, man-made, I should say. In the second and third area, the shock wave has now decreased to about 200 miles an hour, and while that is significantly less than uh, the 500 plus miles per hour of the initial shock wave, a 100 mile an hour wind in a hurricane will destroy every man-made structure and kill those inside of it at 100 miles an hour. So you double that. The blast at 7,000 feet will blow a hole in the ozone layer about 25 miles wide, allowing the infrared rays of the sun to penetrate the earth's atmosphere. Remember many times we read in scripture that one of the, uh, one of the, the advantages, if I can say it that way, that we'll have in heaven is that heaven will protect us from the sun. And we often wonder, oh, I love the sun. Yeah, but the ozone layer protects us from the actual harmful effects of the sun. There'd be a hole, and that would mean every living thing again that could not protect their eyes or its eyes would be immediately blinded. So that means 
any animals outside of this radius that animals don't wear sunglasses, they would be blinded. They would be blinded all over the world. They would be blinded. And people who don't know that you'd have to put on sunglasses when you start uh, losing this, this, this thing, uh, this, this uh, protection from the infrared rays, then you too would be blinded. So that's something to ponder of what is going to be described here in these verses. Now back up to verse number 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Uh, some modern theologians, I always refer to them, is they, they always have an argument. And their argument is here, this is this, this another angel that says, well, that's Christ. That's Christ. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that what this angel does is what Christ would do. But I believe if it was Christ, God would tell us. And I caution always that we need to not go beyond what Scripture tells us. We can, you'll hear me use the word perhaps or it appears, or it looks, and I try to emphasize that to you, or my interpretation is we should not go beyond what God's word tells us and, and hang our head on it, as we would say in our part of Texas. Look at verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God and out of the angel's hand. As I was studying this this afternoon, it, it, it dawned on me when we bought our property out there where we live, we had looked at it a number of times and then we decided we we're gonna buy it and we, we bought it. Uh, we're waiting for all the closing and, and so forth to take place and we decided we'd take one more drive out there and kind of get an idea of where we wanted to build the house. And uh, we didn't have the driveway at that time. I, the property next to us did have one so I'd have to come in that way and then we'd park and walk all over the property. And, and when we was walking over the property, we kept getting this whiff of something that was dead. Dead. And I, I said, well, that doesn't smell right. I said, no, it's because it's, something's dead. She said, well, we've never smelled that before. And I said, no. Well, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been out there. So I started rooting and, and walking around, and I found uh, in between a cluster of trees, a dead calf that had been chewed on by coyotes and probably even some other animals there in the area. And of course, that just escalated its decay and, and uh, so forth, and it stunk. God gave us this ability to enjoy certain smells and not enjoy <laughs> certain smells. If you ever stop to think about it, what if God, God could have reversed it that, it, that you and I would like the dead smells and detest the good smells? I remember traveling throughout the Far East that almost every, from uh, uh, in tai, Taiwan and, and uh, South Korea and, and, uh, and uh, Japan and, uh, and, and all of those countries in through there that I had the opportunity to visit, uh, they all had these incense burning. And their, their philosophy is that certain incense would scare away evil spirits. And, uh, uh, but I must admit that, you know, it, it smelled better than the bad stuff because they weren't the best housekeepers in the world when you get over there at that, that part of the world. But God is, it's interesting that they, they, God emphasizes that the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now we're assuming this smells good from our understanding of smell, but with it combined with the prayers of the saints. Now this is not real clear, but I think this is referring to the 144,000 that are living on the earth at that time during the tribulation period. Remember back uh, at, at the beginning, or back at the end, I should say, of uh, chapter 6, that the angel handing, 
were controlling the, controlling the four winds, uh, that they were getting ready to unleash the wind on the earth. And an angel came out of heaven and said, no, don't do that. We're not done yet. God still has to seal his 144,000. So this seems to make reference to that. But here we see the emphasis of prayer. We just got through praying. Now sometimes I even have to caution myself, particularly when I'm in a hurry. I try to pray every morning, and I try to pray in the evening, and, and if I, 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 I don't mind so much driving, all the, I, driving by myself because I, I just pray. And then all of a sudden I, I realize I've been praying for an hour and I'm here, you know, and that makes my trip a whole lot, whole lot easier. But Satan doesn't want you and I to pray. He, what he does to me is he tries to hurry me up. I made a promise a long time ago that I'd get on my knees and I'd pray before my Lord as long as I was physically able. There's times when I wonder, am I physically able? Getting down ain't the problem. Getting back up is, is the issue. A saint is a saved person. This makes reference to the saints, which gives us the impression that we're talking about those that are alive during that tribulation period. Romans 1, 7 says it this way, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. When we're called to be saints, that means when we receive Christ as our savior, we're called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason one more time for this silence is because God, I think, is pausing. Number one, he's giving one more opportunity. Somehow, I believe that the, and I don't have scripture to back me up. I used to joke about this is a gospel according to Don, and my wife said, you're going to lead somebody down a path that you don't want to lead them down, so don't do that no more. So I stopped doing that. But this is just my interpretation. During this silence, I believe somehow, some way, God is going to give this world, we're not going to be here, but he's going to give this world a heads up. It's coming. It's coming. you got 30 minutes to think about it. <laughs> That's Texan, you know, what we might do, you know. Uh, we would tell our children, what, particularly when I had to repeat myself, I said, I'm not going to say this again. You got 10 seconds to do it, to get going, get moving. Show me you're going to do it. And then they'd usually get in gear. Then I, then I had uh, somebody told me one time, says, well, what you're telling them was that you, they, gotta, they can wait until you say it the second time before you really mean business. Well, we'll see. <laughs> but this refers back to, I think, the fifth seal. It says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. There's prayers going up before God that are both coming from earth underneath the altar as well as they're going from heaven. And it's emphasizing to us that that's God's method of communicating with us. Verse five, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. All of these represent, particularly the thunderings and lightnings and earthquake, represent judgment. Verse 6 and 7, and we'll stop here. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to stand, to sound, rather. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Now, I'll emphasize when we get to this next week that this is God's judgment on the earth at this point, not to mankind, yet he makes it a point of pointing out here that this is this hail and fire mixed with blood. Where does blood come from? Maybe it's coming from the people that are being killed on earth through all of this indirectly. It's kind of, hard to, to, kind of hard for me to comprehend the severity of what God is going to cause on the earth with the fact that it's not directed towards mankind, but to, to, to believe that mankind would be totally 
protected from it. I believe there's, there, there's going to be, uh, for lack of a better term, collateral damage, if you will, because of the way that God is going to do this. It says, the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up. That's the third part of the trees in all the world. A third part of the third part of the trees was burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. So bearing in mind the, the rules I shared with you earlier of interpretation, the first one is that if it's literal, it's literal. Don't try to you know, make anything else out of it. But we'll see in verse 7, verse 8, verse 10, verse 12, specifically all of the judgments are not mentioning man as being targeted, if I can say it that way. But now here we see that it's definitely going to, however, be devastating. It's going to be devastating. We'll close there, and we'll pick that back up in uh, looking at verse 8 next week, and kind of recapping some of it. But as we look at what, uh, go over to Jude, Jud, we'll stop at Jude. Let's go over to Jude for just a moment. The Lord just brought something to my mind. I said this, we're seeing this unfold when we look at uh, what's going on on television in verse 14. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, that means the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints, that's talking about Christ's second coming, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is what we need to pay attention to, verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth spaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Does that not describe what we see going on today? That's right. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for 